Good day, everyone, and welcome to our quarterly Victory Virtual event, Investing in a Time of Inflation. Our presentation today will start with some introductions. We'll then have a review of the equity and fixed income markets. We'll also offer some investment perspective. And lastly, we'll wrap it up with some questions. We received over 80 questions from you during registration, so thank you to everyone that submitted. We'll do our best to get to as many as possible today. Some of you also asked more personal questions, and we will be reaching out to you to review your unique situation. Also, please feel welcome to call us at 800-235-8396 and speak with one of our representatives. My name is Derek Attell, and I am head of sales in the direct investor business. Joining me today is Thomas Allman, West Point graduate, Army veteran, and investment analyst with Victory Capital Solutions, and he'll be covering the equity markets. Also joining us today is Jim Jackson, graduate of the Naval Academy, veteran of the Marine Corps, and head of fixed income portfolio management with USAA Investments. Welcome to you both. Just as a reintroduction of who we are at Victory Capital, we're a global asset management firm with over $154 billion in asset, assets under management. We are publicly traded on the NASDAQ exchange with the ticker VCTR. We serve clients ranging from individual investors to financial advisors and institutional pension plans, all leveraging the same investment expertise. All of us at Victory Capital are committed to providing market insights and resources to you, and they are available on our Investor Insights Hub. We offer market insights and perspectives on the global markets from our investment professionals. A good example of insights you'll find is a recent article titled, Lower Your Stress in a Stock Market Decline, that lists 10 things to consider when markets go down. Additionally, we have our military, military financial readiness section, as well as our Road to Victory video series about financial readiness and transitioning to civilian life. We also wanted to share with you some insights from our recent events you can check out our newest sessions on education savings called Summer Session, which reviews options for saving for education, as well as benefits available for military personnel. We also publish a monthly series called Bonding Over Bonds, featuring Jim Jackson, where he and his team review the fixed income markets. So with that, I'd like to give the floor over to Thomas, where he will be discussing the equity markets. Thank you, Derek. And thank you for attending today's webinar. Let's discuss second quarter's key themes. All three of these are closely related. We have inflation, combating inflation through a higher interest rate, and finally, recession concerns. Inflation continues to be near 40-year highs. Prices are rising, the Russian invasion continues, and supply chains are still struggling. In response, the Fed has continued to raise their Fed funds rate, with the latest increase being 75 basis points in June. The Fed has indicated that they intend to raise the rate going forward as well. Other interest rates, like mortgages, have also increased. And then the last driver for the quarter is fear, specifically recession fears. Concerns over the U.S. entering or already being in a recession contributed to a sell-off in markets. Now let's look specifically at equity market performance. The major market indexes were declined in the second quarter. Let's look at a couple. The US large cap represented by the S&P 500 index was down negative 16.10%. At the bottom of the chart, commodities represented by the Bloomberg Commodities Index were down negative 5.66%, but were still positive year to date. Last time we talked about how inflation impacts the stock market with future cash being worth less in a rising interest rate environment. Within fixed income, we also discussed higher yields and lower prices. But that's just one piece of a larger puzzle. So today, we'll look at how else inflation can affect the economy. And don't worry, we'll keep it at a high level. A main takeaway should be just how difficult it is to try and balance controlling inflation while also considering other factors, such as the economy, jobs, and markets. As a reminder, inflation is the general increase in prices and decline in purchasing power over time. How is the Federal Reserve fighting inflation? What other considerations do they have? They raised the Fed funds rate and have indicated they expect to do so at subsequent meetings. Remember, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, pursuing maximum employment and price stability. And that's a trade-off and it's imperfect. Historically, 
inflation and unemployment are inversely correlated, meaning when unemployment is low, inflation is high. That relationship, again, is not perfect and changes in different cycles. The graph shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation, with inflation on the left axis and unemployment on the right. During the Great Recession and pandemic, unemployment rose while inflation fell sharply. But why does this happen? It's complicated, but in part, when more people are working, they are spending, which increases demand, which increases prices, which leads to inflation. Also, if there are limits to supply or supply chain disruptions, that can lead to producers raising prices. And the opposite is also true. If demand falls, employers may freeze or reduce headcount as they no longer need to produce as much. Keep in mind there are other factors like the labor participation rate and globalization that also influence unemployment. So again, it's not a perfect trade-off, but the Fed does attempt to find a balance. From 2017 until the pandemic, inflation was low before skyrocketing to above 14%. Since the peak, it has steadily decreased to under 4%. At the end of the quarter, there were two job openings per unemployed person. How does this affect us? As the Fed fights inflation, unemployment may increase. Since the Fed has raised their rate already this year and unemployment hasn't increased dramatically, the Fed may interpret this information as showing they can be more aggressive in trying to lower inflation. Let's look at other ways that inflation can impact us. We've already talked about its impact on stocks, bonds, and unemployment. So consumer sentiment, how people feel about the economy, has decreased. With increasing mortgage rates, housing affordability has decreased. Remember, inflation is the increase in prices and decrease in purchasing power over time. Since mid-2021, wage growth has been lower than inflation, meaning employees' salaries are unable to support the same cost of living their purchasing power has gone down. But the good news is that over the last 20 years, we've seen wage growth outpace inflation. So inflation can impact investments, employment, and savings. It can feel overwhelming and overbearing. What can we do? We still believe in a globally diversified portfolio in line with individual risk tolerance and goals over an appropriate time horizon with a disciplined contribution withdrawal process. Market conditions will change. Each quarter, year, and market cycle will be different. Sometimes inflation will be high, and sometimes it will be low. You can be consistent. Now, Jim is going to talk us through the fixed income performance in the second quarter. Jim? Thank you, Thomas. Our first slide in fixed income uh, shows what we've experienced, which is an unprecedented drawdown in the first half of 2022. A drawdown refers to how much an investment or investment portfolio declines from peak to trough. The chart depicts the rolling 12-month returns of the Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, which is a fixed income index representing the investment-grade U.S. bond market. This chart covers the period since 1976. The first half of 2022 experienced the worst fixed income returns in the history of the ag. We should pause to put this into perspective. Over the past 40 plus years, the world has seen a lot of change, but the annual returns of the ag for the period ending June 30th, 2022 were the worst throughout all of it. Worse than the crisis of 2008, 2009, worse than the onset of COVID, worse than the high inflation that was seen in the early 1980s, worse than all of those periods. The negative returns represented here by the various fixed income indices spanning the US market during the second quarter were widespread. Treasury bonds, corporate bonds, muni bonds, high yield bonds, they all experienced negative returns during the quarter. So what were the drivers? Higher Treasury yields as the Treasury market responded to the higher inflation that Thomas previously discussed were one driver. Also, credit spreads increased. Bonds that are not Treasury securities will typically have a higher yield than a Treasury security to compensate for higher risks. The difference in yield is referred to as the credit spread. As Treasury yields rose and credit spreads increased, Yields for fixed income as a whole increased, so prices fell. 
bond prices are inversely related to yield. Now, the news in fixed income is not all bad. Although higher interest rates hurt bond prices now, they improve the prospects for future returns for fixed income investors. As higher yields indicate investors will potentially earn more income per dollar invested than in a lower yield environment. This chart tracks the yield on the Bloomberg US aggregate over the last 30 years. As you can see on the right hand side of the chart, the yield on the ag on June 30th was at the highest level we have seen in more than a decade. Not only have we seen better yields for longer term bonds, but money market yields rose above 1% after spending two years close to 0% when the Federal Reserve kept Fed funds rate near zero. Money markets are closely correlated to the federal funds rate. This chart depicts the changes we have seen in the Fed funds rate and, as represented by the red dots, the current market expectation for the increase in the Fed funds rate through the end of 2022. So in the last quarter, we saw higher yields on bonds, higher yields on money markets, and higher yields on tax-exempt muni bonds. The chart here depicts the yields on tax-exempt muni bonds relative to treasury bonds. Muni yields relative to treasury yields have increased this year, which in our view makes muni bonds attractive relative to treasury bonds. The difficult first half of 2022 for fixed income has improved the yield environment across the U.S. bond market, making for a better potential environment for long-term fixed income investors. We have a few takeaways from the quarter. First, market dislocations tend to reveal your risk tolerance. Second, current yields and fixed income can create a better entry point for long-term investors and allow investors to earn more income per dollar invested. Third, even though fixed income and equities performed poorly in the first half of 2022, we still believe fixed income remains a valuable component of a diversified portfolio with lower volatility than equities over time. I will turn it back over to Derek. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your insight. As you can see, there are a lot of factors that affect the financial markets. And one of the questions that we have been receiving a lot from our investors is when do I make a change to my portfolio? And that answer is, it depends on your asset allocation and goals, but first, what is asset allocation? Asset allocation is often used as a tool to manage risk because different categories of investments are likely to respond to changing economic and political conditions in different ways. By diversifying your investments in different asset classes, you can help reduce the risk of major losses that can result from overemphasizing a single asset class, however resilient you might expect that class to be. You know, for example, stocks and bonds often move in different directions from each other, which is why holding both of these asset classes could help manage risk. But why allocate your assets? Research has shown that asset allocation is the primary driver of investor returns. And I wanted to spend a moment going over the factors and components of asset allocation. So to determine your asset allocation, there are three primary questions that you would need to address. One, what is your investment objective? What are you investing toward? Is it retirement? Is it education? And could be buying a home. Second, what's your time horizon? When will I need my money? Two years, 10 years, 25 years. The reason this is important is it will help determine the balance between stocks and other assets. For example, if you're, invest if you're investing toward a goal, that's a year away, stocks as an asset class carry significantly higher risk and reward, but also have considerably more volatility than bonds and cash. And that potential volatility can take you from achieving your goal to not, depending on the market conditions at the time. Third, risk tolerance. How much risk are you willing to take? 
Or you could also think of it, think of this as the sleep at night factor, meaning how would you respond if your portfolio is down 10%, 20%, 40%? As you can see, finding the balance of these three factors is very important. But once you've determined the allocation, let's also look for a minute at the components of asset allocation, which are stocks, bonds, and cash and money market and the roles that they play. There's several ways to view these asset classes, but for today's purposes, we're gonna look at them as a whole. Stocks are there for capital appreciation and a little bit of income that could come from dividends. They carry the highest risk and the highest reward potential. Bonds are there to generate income. They carry a moderate risk and a moderate reward potential. And then lastly, cash and money market. They are there for preservation of capital, which has the, obviously the lowest risk and the lowest potential. But there's one additional factor to review, and that is reviewing your allocation regularly, just like you go to the doctor regularly for checkups. And let me explain. Let's take a hypothetical investor in 2012. So January 2012, it was determined to achieve their investment goals and risk tolerance and time horizon. They would have a 60% equity, 35% fixed income, and 5% cash allocation. And for illustrative purposes, we're using the total US stock market index, the total US bond market index, and the money market index. Now, as the portfolio is invested in the market as an effect, and is affected by market forces, it is natural for the original balance, in this case, 60, 35, five to change. But if you don't regularly review the portfolio along the journey, that can lead to an undesired amount of risk being taken. So as you see here, by June of 2022, the 60, 35, five portfolio balance has changed. It is now nearly 84% equity, 14% bonds, and not quite 2% cash, significantly higher than originally constructed in this hypothetical example. Here, this client is 10 and a half years closer to achieving their investment goal and is taking more risk than they had initially desired. So the question then becomes, what do we do now? And so first, take a step back and review the markets without emotion. Second, identify your investment goals and then ask, has something changed? Has your time horizon changed? Has, has something in your life changed? Have you bought a home or, or, or had a child or earned a promotion? Third, understand and accept your tolerance of risk. And then fourthly, allocate or reallocate to a risk appropriate portfolio that allows you to ride out the inevitable periods of volatility. With that, I'd like to, to shift over to address some of the questions that we received. And a lot of them have come in and we're asking things like, what, when should I do something about my portfolio? We did our best to address as many of them as we could here. But again, for specific questions, please call us and we can go over your circumstances in more detail. First question is for uh, Jim Jackson, which is, Jim, if you could touch on the outlook and your thoughts specifically on treasury bonds. Sure, thanks, Derek. Uh, you know, we, we think of treasury bonds in the context of your total fixed income portfolio. Treasury bonds typically serve the role uh, within fixed income of allowing you to, to manage your risk and the overall liquidity of your portfolio. We certainly use them in managing our funds and ETFs for those very reasons. Thanks, Jim. Uh, shifting over to Thomas for our next question is, you, you spent a lot of time talking about inflation. Could you touch on specifically how precious metals could work to, to possibly hedge inflation as an investment? Yeah, absolutely, Derek. Uh, historically, we've seen precious metals, gold especially, serve as a store of value when the purchasing power of the dollar declines. Uh, there's a few other points worth mentioning, though. Uh, there's different ways to invest in precious metals. So investors can invest in physical precious metals, like a gold or silver bar. They can invest in an investment vehicle that tracks those products, or they could invest in companies that are associated with those products, something like gold miners, or some combination of any of those three. And then keep in mind, there's other investment options that also have historically had a low correlation to inflation, such as treasuries. And the last thing I'd mention is that you just make sure you understand the risks. 
the, there's volatility and opportunity cost uh, when you're owning precious metals. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate that. One of the other questions that, that we received is, is there hope for recovery back to the 2021 highs? And I'll address this one. <clears throat> Pardon me. Is While well, past performance is no guarantee of future returns, if you look at the history of the market over the past decades, it generally has an upward trend. Now, granted, that takes time. There are periods of time where the market is volatile, down, and flat. That's where time horizon becomes really, really important. You know, a three-year time horizon is very different than 15 or 20 years down the road. Because the greater the time, the more your portfolio can participate in the market. So another question we, we have here, um, I'm gonna go back to Jim. We received several questions on money market funds, savings accounts, talking about volatility or stability, preservation of capital, et cetera. So Jim, can you touch a little bit more on that, please? Sure, sure can. The uh, well, savings accounts and money for market funds can both serve the role uh, of cash in your portfolio as they both have stable prices with the intention of preserving capital. There are key differences between the two, however. Uh, first, with a savings account, you are effectively lending money to a, a bank where your deposit is insured up to 250000 by the FDIC. A money market fund is lending to a variety of, of issuers uh, over short lending periods. Second, the rates on savings accounts are set by the bank and are typically slow to adjust to higher rates. You should remember that a savings account, you are lending money to a bank and the bank doesn't necessarily have an incentive to increase the rates that it's paying you unless it needs to attract deposits into their accounts. Money market fund rates are determined by market rates. So they adjust very quickly to changes in rates in the overall market environment. Uh, we've certainly seen that this year as money market rates have increased alongside the Fed funds rate. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that differential. And um, next question is for Thomas. So can you touch on asset classes that historically have done better in volatile times? Yeah, I really like that question. Uh, it's a little hard to answer though, since volatility can be subjective in the sense that everyone has a different risk tolerance and time horizon like you talked about. So for example, one investor might be comfortable with a 20% market move over a year, a year while another investor might not be comfortable with that. And so one of Jim's key takeaways from the quarter was that periods of market downturns can really reveal your risk tolerance. So understanding the risk that you're taking in terms of how a uh, asset moves within a general range and then the historical drawdown is important. To answer that question more directly, uh, there's been periods of volatility caused by all sorts of events and so different asset classes have done well. Uh, a well-diversified portfolio with exposure to different asset classes like equities and fixed income or cash in regions like the US or international and with a risk level you're comfortable with is probably the best way um, to be prepared for different environments. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Jim, for all of your insights and perspective. Also just wanna thank everyone for attending. We really appreciate your time. Please reach out to us at 800-235-8396. You can also visit us online at investor.vcm.com. We're also online as well through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you everyone so much. I appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you next quarter. Thanks so much.